Hello and welcome to our British Library South Asia seminar series, which is part of our research and digitization project called Two Centuries of Indian Print. Today we have uh, Dr. Vibhuti Dugal, who's going to speak on becoming a listener in mid 20th century North India. Dr. Dugal is assistant professor of film studies at the School of Culture and Creative Expressions, Ambedkar University in New Delhi. She was awarded her PhD in cinema studies from the School of Arts and Aesthetics, Jawaharlal Nehru University on a CSDS ICSSR doctoral fellowship. She works at the intersection of sound, music, and media. Her work has been published in books and journals by Sage, Taylor and Francis, and Oxford University Press. We are very happy to have amongst us, Dr. Pavitra Sundar as a chair for the event. She's an associate professor of literature at Hamilton College. Her scholarly interests span cinema studies, sound studies, post-colonial literary and cultural studies, and gender sexuality studies. She's founding member of the Accent Research Collaborative and is a recipient of CNY Humanities Corridor Awards, South Asia Media and Performance Cultures 2018 to 20. Her forthcoming monograph, Listening to Bollywood, brings a feminist ear to Bombay cinema. About the format of this talk, Vibhuti is going to speak for around half an hour or 45 minutes, and then we'll have a short discussion between the speaker and the chair, after which we'll open it up for audience Q&A. If during the discussion you would like to put in your questions, please use the chat box to do so. So without much further ado, I invite Vibhuti to speak on becoming a listener in mid 20th century North India. Over to you, Vibhuti. Thank you, Priyanka. Thank you so much. Um, I'd just like to share my screen. Uh, I just a quick check if I could. Uh, I just want to know if the screen is visible. It is. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So um, thank you very much uh, uh, to Dr. Priyanka Basu and uh, uh, the South Asian seminar series that she curates at the British Library for inviting me to uh, present my work in this forum. Um, it's, uh, I, I really look forward uh, to this opportunity for feedback and to develop and, you know, uh, in order to be able to develop this work. And I'm also absolutely thrilled that um, I could have Dr. Pavitra Sundar uh, chairing this session. Um, she's someone whose work I have read and admired for a very long time. So it's really a privilege to be able to share this um, in front of her and of course with all of you. And um, thank you all for being here. So uh, before I, uh, uh, so without further ado, I'd like to begin. Um, in this talk, I would like to think about what it could mean to be a listener in the mid 20th century in North India. I do this by focusing on a concert of different practices, which take us to a realm that are not often thought of or not commonly thought of as belonging to listening. In so doing, I look specifically at the production of radio listeners clubs or Shrota Sangh, uh, as they were called magazines uh, and some of the writing found therein. Uh, specifically narratives about how one became a listener. Um, for those familiar with Hindi, Meshrota Kese Bana Ya Meshrota Kese Bani. Across this material, I posit the possibility of thinking the figure of the listener through uh, what I would like to tentatively call a vernacular techniques of sound by turning from the question of who or what the listener is to asking the question, what is listening? Before beginning, however, with exploring what it means to be listener uh, in mid 20th century North India, let me first try and lay out an answer to the question. How is this listener understood or discussed? In order to, uh, sorry, in order to consider uh, the listener, it is the first question that we must ask. Consider for instance, this example, um, K.S. Malik, the station director of All India Radio, uh, produces a typology of listeners in an essay on the listener's role in the Radio Times of India in 1961. 
where he distinguishes listeners as wavelength wanderers, general listeners, and so on, um, and separates that category of listeners from the attentive listener who could be listening singly in the comfort of his home or collectively in groups or publicly. Malik's comments are, of course, made in the early 1960s, but this disdainful discourse about the listener um, and the inattentive wavelength wanderer has persisted over the years. Listeners, a former radio announcer with AIR remarked to me, were of two kinds. In 2012, he was amongst the first to indicate what I would hear repeated by various people. Radio announcers, creators of uh, uh, Geet Koshes or compendiums of songs, and others who had been part of the world of radio. That 90% of listeners would listen only for their name very carefully on air, were interested in sending farmayashes, but not interested in listening very carefully. These were also the ones who would usually be carpenters, tailors, small shop owners, or lower middle class or working class tradesmen. Only 10% of the listeners, he continued, were ones who would pay attention, who would really be interested in the music and not just in hearing their names. Um, the phrase then that they, they just wanted to hear their name, or they meaning the listeners, is a statement that was repeated by almost everyone I spoke with. Um, thus, radio personnel, as well as people who consider themselves serious radio listeners, um, including those who reminisced about radio stations of the mid 20th century, went about dividing listeners into those who just wanted to hear their names on air and those who were connoisseurs of music, or at the very least, people interested or listeners interested in music, and not importantly, in their own names. Certainly, this typology of listeners or the discourse around the characteristics of listeners, including good listeners, was a practice of distinction, which was both class laden as well as structured along the dynamics of metropolitan and small town. In both instances, such a typology appeared as presenting itself, engaging with listening as a marker of cultural capital um, or its absence. Typology and practices of the distinction notwithstanding, I'm interested in the ways in which these so-called non-listener radio listeners thought about themselves, positioned themselves and articulated themselves through creating, through creating and writing magazines that they call Shota Sangha magazines or radio listeners clubs magazines. I will focus thus on some of these magazines and the narratives that they contain for most of this talk, both to showcase them as forgotten and untold bits of archival evidence, as well as to think through the magazines and its creators, users, readers, and their investment in the film song and the radio. Using these magazines and the tales they tell, I wish to take these non-listener listeners seriously, to use their writings and their work in the form of these magazines as sources to construct one. Histories of radio in India. Two, histories of engagement with the film and the film song in India, as well as three, to argue for a vernacular techniques of sound. Before I uh, proceed further, a small aside on the role of the film song in this narrative. I choose to focus on a sound that has been acknowledged uh, as one of the most dominant sounds, um, uh, as one of the most dominant sounds in the acoustic ecology of North India, particularly, but also parts of East and West India and Pakistan, certainly, if not further afield, which is the film song. The film song's ubiquity is, of course, a truism that has often been remarked upon. Um, known for its popularity, its widespread circulation and permeation of the urban and often even rural soundscape, and indeed its repeatability across formats and contexts. Festivities, both religious and secular, as well as everyday life, ranging from um, public safety announcements uh, to everyday idioms, from the contemporary moment to the past, from being called the, the common man's wisdom to participating in everyday life uh, as a soundtrack in large parts of India and South Asia. It is this ubiquity and popularity that allow me to strategically deploy the film song in two ways. One, to consider it as a metonym for cinema itself. And two, to stand in for sound. In other words, for me, the song, even as it may be disaggregated into the singing or speaking or laughing or humming voice, the musical track, any external noises and or other elements are taken together as sound. Sound, uh, in this instance, like electricity, may be studied as it passes through and congeals in objects like films, radios, and magazines, 
um, and in each case, its trace differs. It may also arguably be, uh, it may also be foregrounded by focusing on techniques such as humming, reciting, singing, listening, and arguably even reading and writing. In other words, to be able to examine sound, one must do so in media stress, since it is not an object in the way in which radios, films, and magazines are, but rather is already passing through several objects, processes, and environments. This produces for us a situation of relations then, particularly those that are across and between media. Sound then emerges intermedially, and thus by corollary, is both multimodal and multisensorial. In this way, my approach is in concert with scholarship that locates sound as emerging through and with complex intermaterial practices. And in the case of these magazines, sound appears not as established sources of sound, for instance, in the form of musical notations or lyrics or remarks upon musical albums, but rather they appear through the figure of the listener and the listener's engagement with the film song and the radio. They appear indirectly to the very act of producing these magazines as writings in relation to sound, music, and listening. Thus, the traces through which sound appears and what constitutes comments and sound are things we are forced to revise as we consider this material. The magazines that I refer to were produced by radio listeners clubs, which mushroomed across kasbas, small kasbas, um, small towns and cities in Hindi-speaking North India, um, especially during the first two, uh, two or three decades post Indian independence. These were published from small cities and town, small towns across Bihar, Madhya Pradesh, Uttar Pradesh, and Rajasthan for the most part. These are all states, um, for those who are unfamiliar with um, uh, the Indian uh, map uh, in, in the northern half of India. Um, there were a few published from Maharashtra and at least one from Asansol in West Bengal. Now, these were usually brought out by different groups of people uh, who, call them, who often call themselves listeners and would form radio listening clubs under different names. Often, though not always, these radio listeners clubs would name themselves after the place that they belong to. For example, the Oraya Radio Shrota Sangh or the Riva Radio Shrota Sangh, after the towns Oraya and Riva respectively. One of the stated objectives of most of these clubs was to bring out these kinds of publications, um, a sample of which um, is on the screen in front of you. Um, the writings in these publications vary tremendously from uh, uh, writings on radio, film music and cinema, to short stories, poems, jokes and parodies, to interviews with radio personnel and other listeners, to short essays that historicized listeners clubs and their activities, um, including publishing these magazines, organizing seminars and gatherings and so on. They also carried addresses of radio stations, advertisements and names and addresses of listeners who do not belong to the club, but who had expressed an interest in um, being part of uh, a group of, uh, a group to maintain correspondence with or had supported the club in some way. Specifically, um, there, is, there are not many of these uh, magazines left in the form of complete runs. Um, in fact, there is only one which I found, uh, which is called the Listener's Bulletin, which begins its life as Radio News in 1971. And by the middle of 1973 has changed its name to Listener's Bulletin, the one it continues to bear. This magazine was registered with the Registrar of Newspapers of India. However, most of the other magazines and periodicals were not. While this periodical continues, oh, sorry, while this magazine continues to be printed at about three or four times a year, um, there were a large number, possibly hundreds of such magazines which were published during this period, which were unable to sustain themselves in the present. These magazines were often produced on inexpensive, low quality and thin paper, especially when compared with the print quality of a published book or a film or literary magazine that belonged to well-established Hindi or other vernacular press. Thus they had as printed and bound objects more in common with four page leaflets publicizing films and film songs called chopatiyas, literally four pages or leaves, which were sold near cinema halls, railway stations, and sometimes at Panwadi's, uh, which is the beetle leaf sellers shop than highbrow or even middlebrow vernacular Hindi literature. 
However, these magazines were usually subscription based and circulated amongst groups of people, uh, more men, less women, who were participating in the process of listening to the radio, writing to the radio and to each other. Often these magazines were printed locally, sometimes in streets not far away from where those who had composed the words for their pages lived. In some cases, presumably depending upon the amount of funding available for the magazine, the name of the printing press has been given. In others, there is no indication of where the magazine is printed. Of course, there is no single publisher for um, any of these magazines. Sometimes there would be no month or year of publication. They were simply titled by the name they had adopted. Gita Anjali, Ashikana, uh, Pakiza, so on. Um, often they were published around primarily religious festivals such as Holi or Diwali or national holidays like Republic Day. Um, in that sense, they even as magazines, there, there is no sense of periodicity uh, to them, any kind of regular uh, seriality um, to them that we come to associate with uh, other uh, uh, magazines such as film magazines or literary magazines. Um, so there would be the sheer absence of a re regular period of publication, whether weekly or monthly or annual, etc. More interesting would be to consider the period and the event that the magazine used in terms of religious festivals, a springtime festival, an autumn one, another one in midwinter and so on. What much of this indicates is arguably the manner in which these magazines were embedded in events, both local and national. Even before we start looking at the content of the magazines then, we may note the relationship between the format of the period of the magazine. Um, so for instance, it's being structured around sociocultural or religious events and sociality. The audience for these magazines seems to have been fairly, fairly variable. Um, of course, encompassing those who were literate, but also those who may not have come within the traditionally received, perceived ambit of literacy, including Panwadi's farmers and workers. In one of the Radio Club magazines, there was an advertisement for a Hindi magazine, which specifically hailed farmers, workers, and listeners clubs together as its readers. Consider then that these magazines were not merely providing us with glimpses into film and radio history, but were also finding ways of making note of the ephemerality and locality of small everyday sites of listening, um, such as um, bringing together those who were uh, perhaps outside uh, of its ambit. Um, for instance, one of the um, one of the uh, one of one such site that would uh, find repetition in uh, in and across most of these magazines would be the pan shop, um, and it would include those who uh, interviews of those who owned them, advertisements of pan shops, um, and also people who just sat at the pan shops and listened. Consider, uh, for example, um, uh, an interview of. Gopal Charasya of Chaja Munger um, in the 1976 issue of a magazine called The Interview, uh, which was published by the Asan Sol Radio Shota Sang, which contained the report, uh, uh, which contained this report of uh, a meeting and an interview with Gopal Charasya. The article, the article um, in question calls Charasya a mashur radio shrota, a famous radio listener. Um, and Chaurasia was uh, someone who owned and ran a pawn shop near the Jhaja railway station. Chaurasia, in his conversation uh, with the author Ram Prasad, comments, albeit indirectly, in, in, you know, in, uh, in, in and through the interview, one of the things that we um, notice is the way in which um, the pawn shop per se becomes part of um, the life world of um, radio listening, the life world of sending for Mayashas. So it's um, when, when, therefore, when by the time we come to thinking about the practice of distinction, uh, again, we really get a sense of who it is um, and what, uh, where they're located um, uh, where, as we're able to look through these interviews. Uh, so Charasya and Charasya has some had some very interesting remarks upon 
radio listening and um, the practice, one of the things that he said, for instance, was um, an indirect comment about the importance of the announcer and how his voice sounds on air and how they were tied into the listener's desire to write into the program. Because on being asked why his name is no longer heard on air, he said, Phir Mahajan ki chale jane ke baad, uh, so this is a reference to, he's saying that um, after Manohar Mahajan's departure, Manohar Mahajan being a famous radio announcer with Radio Ceylon in, um, uh, in, in the late 60s and early 70s, after Mahajan's departure, all the programs sounded out of tune. Such an encounter tells us of the significance of the perceived quality of uh, the announcer's voice but it also tells us equally that the listener is not um, is not someone uh, who is necessarily bound always by the narrative of being set up as someone who will send in uh, and who will listen out for his name on air. Um, in spite of being clubbed as someone whose uh, name uh, appears on air, he places before us an aesthetic choice, um, an aesthetic, qual uh, uh, he, he comments upon uh, the announcer's voice's quality and actually in that sense, positions himself as not being part of any preconceived template, much, very much like the magazines that he was being interviewed for. So some of these magazines would then have page numbers and the articles would have titles, whether, whereas others would not. Um, in certain cases, um, it was simply impossible uh, to try and provide any kind of or even try and find any kind of complete bibliographic information. Inconsistent in page count, ranging from no more than eight pages to more than 60. These magazines are also worth, well worth placing within the broader Hindi print sphere, um, especially in certain kinds of continuities with other popular Hindi film magazines and other popular Hindi magazines of the time, including Sushma Madhuri, Sarita Dharam Yuga and others. And the former two magazines, um, which is Sushma and Madhuri, particularly focused on the filmic, including the musical, and bordered on an engagement with the literary, while the latter primarily focused on the literary, occasionally drawing on the filmic. All four magazines, Sushma Madhuri, Sarita and Dharam Yuga, um, had different publication histories, belonged to different publishing houses, different publishing timelines, but all produced a milieu within which these listeners clubs bulletins interacted with them in terms of language, uh, often in terms of genres of writing that were produced. In being part of this milieu, they helped train the, uh, the they helped train um, the reading and listening body, but also that the listening body uh, or uh, in, in this case, um, the body of the user who accessed the listeners clubs magazines would have had access to some of these forms, if not in writing, but at least orally. For instance, that uh, the practice of these magazines being read out at these very barn shops. I wish to uh, focus um, or turn my attention now away from the Shrota Sang magazines and the world that they are part of particularly uh, to one kind of narrative that emerged in uh, these magazines, which is I'd like to look at the narrative of becoming listener. So how did I become a listener? Um, that often peppered these magazines and were written by the readers and radio listeners clubs members themselves. I'd like to use these narrative, narratives of becoming listeners to locate the readers of these magazines as they were, listeners, readers, and writers together. The act of listening was thus both physically tuning into the sounds of the radio, but also recalling radio sounds and radio programmings through these magazines by writing into them as well as by reading them. These magazines would then form part of the milieu that listening was formed through. I'm looking then at uh, three interrelated elements here. One, the content of the narratives, um, and thus an examination of the phrase and consequently the concept of becoming listener. Two, uh, to foreground uh, the act of writing oneself as listener. Um, 
And three, to think through the objects that these magazines um, were um, and how they brought radio and cinema together. So the narrative of these stories is fairly straightforward and deployed a common coming of age as listener trope. Um, the trope took the following form. Um, I, the narrator and author, was a casual or inattentive listener. I heard programs such as Aapki Ki Geet, Songs For You, or uh, Jab Aap Ka Uthe, When You Sang, or some other, usually listeners request based program on air, um, irrespective of a specific radio station, whether it was Radio Ceylon, Vivid Bharti, or any other All India radio station, whether local or national, uh, sorry, or any other All India radio station. So that stirred in me uh, the desire to hear the trope continues that stirred in me the desire to hear my name on air. One fine day I started writing in requests and thereafter became a listener. This trope was found in most listeners clubs bulletins uh, one after another, but not all. In fact, the presence and absence of such stories in uh, radio clubs magazines also became a marker of distinction. Thus, the serious radio clubs, uh, radio listeners clubs, magazines would engage with radio programming, look towards collecting and exchanging notes and material about music, especially film music, and eschew all things associated with um, the Farmaish writers, the listeners request writers. Um, the disdain of these serious listeners and magazines notwithstanding, let's look at this trope in slightly greater detail because it provides us with interesting ways of considering the figure of the listener as someone who writes and listens. For instance, consider one such story written by Sri Rampur's Ramesh Sonmani. Now, this story was found in Suman um, in the October of 1976. This issue was brought out by two listening clubs together. Um, the, these were the Reva, the Reva Radio Shruta Sangh and the Rashmi Radio Listeners Association. Um, both from a small town um, in Madhya Pradesh. The story begins by telling us, um, let me tell you about my romantic tale of listening. It proceeds then to inform uh, the reader about an ordinary winter's day when the narrator woke up, lazed around in bed and turned on the radio. While listening to radio programs on the Sri Lanka Re Broadcasting Corporation or Radio Salon, he heard a listener's request based program which featured friends from his town. At that moment, the narrative says, he decided to send in a farmaish himself. After this, he says one after another, he sent in requests to all the radio stations, Ceylon, with Bharti, and other local radio stations. And then one day, the incessant sending in of requests paid off. His name was announced along with the song, Ek Pyar Ka Nagma Hai. It's a song of love, which is a well-known uh, film song. Apart from the descriptions of happiness at hearing his name, the narrator mentions at the end, in this way, I had become a listener. I wish to think about what it means to write about becoming a listener based on narratives of how one became a listener. In Ramesh Sonwane's story and other similar tales, becoming a listener would also be synonymous in, uh, with active participation on the radio through Farmayash's or participation in the Radio Listeners Club. The writers of these stories would try and mark out the point where they felt that they had finally become a listener. So what are the implications of such narratives? So I try to, in this um, next part of the paper, gloss the phrase becoming listener um, in a, a few ways. One, I try to consider the way in which sonic experiences are, are articulated. Two, I think about what it means to actually become a listener. And lastly, um, I'd like to remind um, us of uh, situating this trope of coming of age as a listener amongst other discussions of listeners and listening that takes place in the magazines, uh, both in these magazines as well as the broader um, Hindi, film, uh, period, uh, Hindi film and Hindi literary magazines of the time. First, let us consider the articulation of sonic experience. Here, it appears to be about the processes which are brought into the fold of listening, namely, uh, or sorry, particularly on and through the radio, namely, A, the physical act of hearing the radio, two, writing for mashes, three, the identification of hearing one's name on air, 
um, and so on and so forth. There are also, at this point of time, uh, I would like to remind uh, us of the distinctions being made between serious listeners, wavelength wanderers, and so on, outside of these narratives, also as processes and moments that are being brought into the fold of uh, sonic experience, the, that are being brought into the fold of um, what it means to listen. So what if we were to start gathering all these points together across all these stories um, and all the conflicting points at which one is marked as having passed into the stage of having become a listener? One is faced in a sense with Zeno's paradox. The question then becomes, when does the, uh, in, uh, in the listener stories about when and how they became listeners, at what precise point did they become listeners? And in this, I'm considering not just the radio listeners narratives in the magazines, but also across uh, the various distinctions of serious, non-serious listeners that are being made. So when did they become listeners? Was it when the name was heard? Was it in the anticipation of the name being heard? Was it when the film song itself was being played? When is it? Is it at all possible to mark across these various senses of who or what a listener is or when or how the listener is made? Or is there an impasse here? Because like the famous philosophical arrow of Zeno's paradox, the listener must either implode in the first point on its path or the listener will remain in motion, much like the film song that it wants to hear. The listener was then in passage across the several points that came up. Being listener can never be then. One is forever becoming listener. The expression becoming listener then also simultaneously gathers together and exceeds each of these uh, points, which in themselves are multimedia, multimodal, and multisensorial because they're working with different kinds of technologies, print, sound, and playback devices, such as the radio. Becoming offers us then the possibility, or to think becoming listener offers us then the possibility of relations amongst milieu or among the milieu. And the possibilities of relations are nowhere foregrounded as they are another um, critical narrative that the content of these stories can carry. That of, um, techniques, which may be identified as including the practices of attentively listening to radio programs, particularly for myish based ones, writing requests, postcards, and letters to various radio stations and radio programs, waiting to hear one's name on air, and so on. In order to think of these as techniques of sound through these magazines, it would be fruitful to consider the act of writing stories as listeners and how that feeds into listening. Um, to pay attention to writing as practice is to focus on the relations between reading, writing, listening, and indeed to pay attention to the recursivity between these acts of reading, writing, and listening. In and through these magazines, um, I'd even like to suggest that there is a certain um, also recursivity between objects and practices. The object not only bears the trace of the practice of listening, but becomes a participant in the practice of listening itself. Before um, I proceed to sort of um, develop uh, this argument a little further, um, let us recall and uh, uh, let us not forget that these were amateur acts of writing and publishing, which followed certain very specific rhetorical strategies and tropes. And as we have seen above, the very claim to the listener was fraught. But prior to this moment of being us and them, serious, non-serious, listener who sends for Mayesh, non-listener who doesn't, who's a casual uh, listener, lies the I and the we, both the psychic individuated figure and the collective. Underlying both these categories then is the production of the listener and the conditions that produce it. Thus, before asking who or what a listener is, another question does appear. What does it mean to listen? Or in other words, what is listening? I'd like to um, 
point out a small difference between the title uh, um, of my talk and the title that um, was registered. Um, becoming listener and becoming a listener. Initially, um, I had thought that I would write in uh, to the curator of the series, Dr. Basu, and say, I, I think we should work with becoming listener. On second thought, however, I let the a uh stand. The inclusion of the article a uh, forced me to articulate what seemed to be a schism in my work that I'd struggled with for a while. There seemed to be a cleavage between becoming a listener, which indicated the local, locatable, historical, and specific nature of the listening techniques, objects, and stories in mid 20th century North India, and more abstract ideas of listening, i.e. becoming listener, that emerged from continental philosophical paradigms. Till I realized that to become a listener historically in a particular epoch was to participate in a process of becoming, always being in movement. Becoming listener and becoming a listener were effectively the same thing. And central to this act of becoming was the techniques of sound. Before I proceed, a small um, explanation of techniques. I use the term um, much as, as it has been well established to refer to the coming together of technologies, the techniques and practices of body and use that are engendered as well as processes of externalizations of memory, um, including the use of devices such as monuments and objects, and the individuation that are central to our very condition of living. To open up listening in India in the mid 20th century then, from the vantage point of the early 21st, um, I find myself conducting an archeology span of listening. Uh, now, Susan Douglas understands an archaeology of listening as historicizing various modes of inattentive listening to the radio, uh, inattentive or attentive modes of listening to the radio, identifying them variously as informational, dimensional, and associational. She brings insights from psychology in order to frame the repeated acts of listening to the radio, as well as listening to music on air in this act of archaeology. Drawing upon Douglas's term in her process of historicizing, I inflect its meaning with paying attention to listening emerging not only from an excavation of cultural practices that surround radio and film in mid 20th century India, but also crucially to see these as technical practices. In other words, while Douglas underscores radio's importance to listening as a sociocultural and political practice, I'm invested in, I am invested in the way in which listening emerges as distributed across various media objects, infrastructures, and practices. I treat archaeology of listening then in a capacious and media archaeological sense, bringing together film, radio, print, and other sound media. It is to this end that I treat the radio, film, and the magazines I draw upon as objects, as interfaces that process variously the environmental, the technological, the sonic, and the political. In doing so, they constitute intermediate relations that allow us to foreground listening. Crucially, I also structure this act of listening by thinking about the transmission of um, uh, and the repeated availability of the film song between and across these media in the mid 20th century. Listening for me then um, emerges not only as distributed, but centered squarely on techniques learned across these various forms. Listening, I argue, is then not only about listening with the ear physically, but fundamentally about activating oral and muscular consciousness that had listened when reading the song, when writing into radio stations requesting for the song, or indeed will listen. Listening, in other words, is as much about practices of inscription, language, and memory, as it is about listening to disembodied voices amplified through loudspeakers and played via radios and gramophones, or conversely stabilized through telephones. The listening body is formed, trained, and repeated through these several media and their allied practices. Or a training through process of recordings, whether it, um, through gramophone or print material. The listener is produced across varied material practices, which include, in this case, reading and writing, but also, and crucially, um, something that I don't focus upon in, um, in this particular talk at all, practices of humming, singing, hearing the song physically, publicly, and collectively. Listening then uh, and an engagement with sound and sound media is found in traces in magazines and film which provide evidence to think about the imbricated practices of reading, writing and viewing as well. 
Listening then, um, I'd like to suggest is thus attunement, an attunement born in, across and off social, musical, linguistic, technological and cinematic practice. All of them, of course, technical practices. Listening as attunement is figured through an assemblage of devices, memory and the formations of oral consciousness. The process of attunement is as much about the affordances of technologies in an, in an epoch, as well as a series of variable bodily techniques, which in this case includes both the act of physically having heard sound or reproduced it through recall or inscription. It is equally though in India, especially in the mid 20th century about the social and the vernacular finding trace in sound whether in the form of reference to practices of sending parmaishas or practices of distinction and so on. A neat distinction between sociality, sound and techniques is then difficult to establish, I would like to suggest in the Indian context. Without making a claim to provincializing Europe or the global south, um, I argue that the vernacular or the local in terms of sociality and sound, including the sounds of language, is central to the techniques of sound. Consequently, the listener is figured in and through these techniques as multimodal, multisensorial, and emerges as vernacular, both in his location, his, her, or their location in the small town, but also in the idiom of uh, the idiom, both in terms of language, but also the idiom in terms of sound, um, in this case, Hindi Urdu. An examination of the techniques of listening finds itself. Um, thus, uh, uh, an examination of these techniques, um, I imagine, finds uh, itself also in conversations with scholars that locate technicity as a key to the study of sound, um, especially in the context of the global south. To examine listening closely, then, is to examine the techniques of sound, especially as they find themselves at stake today in the digital with the appearance of machine listening, which mimics the recursivity of human memory practices and positions recognition and, rec and recommendation in new ways. The horizon of the digital is one where new colonial capitalist forms and modes of listening threaten to take over in the form of audio surveillance. And music streaming apps are of course transforming soundscapes, bodily habitations and memory itself. To excavate and reflect upon the techniques of sound in the long theory thus, as I have tried to do, becomes more urgent in the digital presence, in the digital present. In a sense then, the digital constitutes the degree zero, which allows us to reflect upon these past practices, technologies and imaginaries. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Vibhuti. That was wonderful. I would now like to invite uh, Dr. Pavitra Sundar to have a discussion with Vibhuti, after which we'll open it up for question and answers. Thank you. Thank you, Priyanka. And thank you so much, Vibhuti. As always, um, I, I learned so much from reading and listening to your work. So thank you for this. Um, I think one of the things I really uh, appreciate about your intervention on this topic um, is that you reframe listening as, an, um, as more than just listening, as an intermedial practice or process, right? And so that uh, in, what's happening is when you shift the question from who or what is a listener to what is listening, there's, a, there's another question you're asking that's implicit, which is how do we listen? Right. How does so that's the sort of that's the question in between that gets you from who is the listener, what is the listener to what is what is listening? Um, and of course, what it means to listen, as you were suggesting, I think, towards the end of your talk, is perhaps slightly different at different historical moments, given the, our engage, given these different evolving techniques, uh, 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 vernacular techniques of sound. Um, in addition, I think what you're doing is you're also shifting um, um, how we think about sound itself, right? Sound as, or what is a sonic text? So, so as we, as scholars of, of music and sound listen, we now have to think about what, what it is that we are constituting as the object um, so that it's not just, you know, we put on our headphones and listen to sound uh, for hours on end and then write something up about it, but we're also, thinking about literary texts or texts that are non-literary, right? So 
texts of the bazaar, texts that are that would otherwise be dismissed of as low culture. So there's a methodological intervention here. There's a shift in the in how we're constituting the object as well as um, layers of theoretical intervention. So thank you. Um, I guess my questions today revolve around two, two matters, time and place. Right? And I'm really struck by the formulation of um, uh, becoming listener, right? Um, there's a continuity, it's a continuous process, it's sort of future oriented in the, in the way that it's phrased, at least in English, right? But in the story um, that, you, that you read out, um, I think it was becoming listener is something that has already happened. Right, it's a retrospective narration, right? And it's also in the Hindi, it's istara me shrota ban chuka tha. I had already become listener, right? And maybe there are other stories that cast it as, I don't know, istara me shrota banta gaya or some other temporal mm. formulation, right? Mm. But it seems to me there's something going on there with um, time that it would be worth talking about a bit more. Um, I have a question about place too, but shall I stop there and let you? pop in with a comment uh i don't know priyanka what would you oh i don't know if she has a particular recommendation but um, i'm it's noting them down okay but i'm noting them down pavitra so if you would like to just sort of huh so my okay so i'll continue with the next question here um the other question i think uh, has to do with place right and i think what you so beautifully show us i'm gonna um refer back to the beginning, towards the beginning of the talk, um, you talk about how sound is already passing through several objects, processes, and environments. Um, sound as that, as a, that produces a situation of relations, um, those that are across and between media. And that, I think, as your paper um, demonstrated, um, makes a whole lot of sense to me. And there's this, I'm struck by the sense of movement Right, that is built into this notion of sound. We can only understand sound in thinking of it across as it moves across these different texts and moments, but also as something that is constituted through that movement. Right? And it seems to me that there's a tension there between that and this linking of uh, Shrota Sangh's uh, Sang to place, right? because so many of them are named after the place where the people listen from, right? Um, and so um, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to keep that sense of motion and movement, conceptual motion and movement in play, even as I think about the ways in which this social geographic sonic imaginary is being constructed precisely through invocations of place, right? So as you say in your other work, uh, listeners listened in to hear their names on air, right? But also to hear the name of their place on air. Um, so there's a mooring in place that is also sort of constantly in uh, being questioned, if you will, in, in and through movement. Um, so those are the two broad questions I thought of as you were speaking to me. Hey, uh, thanks, Pavitra. I, it, this is just uh, fantastic. I, unfortunately, I have to be honest and uh, you know confess that I hadn't thought of either of the two questions that you've posed to me. So I'm not really sure I have um, answers, but I am, um, I am really um, interested in what you're saying about time um, and the way in which there is a certain kind of, as you, as you point out very correctly, that there's in some senses a, a retrospective narrative for some of them as well. I had already become a listener in this way. Um, I think why um, why I'm holding on to the uh, to the to, to the future sense of, especially the English sense of becoming listener as opposed to um, closing it off with uh, the Hindi of I had become or um, is to actually um, to try and look across the narratives, sort of uh, both the diversity of narratives, but also to think about, um, I think to think about more broadly as to 
what is this relationship between past and present in terms of listening itself? And I think that's really where your question kind of hits into, because even if there is this retrospective construction of myself as listener, um, how do I really hold on to say, okay, I have marked out, this is the moment I became listener in that story. But somebody else has said that you are not listener at all. And then there's someone else. And there is also another layer where I am listener because I have sent in the request. But somebody else who's not sent in the request or doesn't send in requests is not yet listener. So I think it's that kind of, um, I, I, I really, I want to be able to gather the stories, but I do like the question of time that you've posed because I still think there is something of tremendous value there in terms of um, more broadly, how to think about uh, what, it, what it means to really kind of think through uh, how this is a process in time because, and, and the, I'm still hoping to unpack it's something I haven't quite done um, is its relationship with memory right and the just the very sort of um, how songs are being asked for how they're being the the, the way in which um, there's a repeated sense of listening taking place across contexts and so on again um, so I think time is going to be very significant except I, I really haven't unpacked that yet at all yeah, so sorry, I don't know if I... No, no, this is great. So I guess one thing that also occurs to me as you speak is that it, even in these, so one, it seems that it's an implicit answer to people like K.S. Malik who are saying, oh, there are these inattentive listeners who are non-listeners. Even if these stories don't, the writers don't say, they think we are not. Those arbiters of high culture don't think we are listeners but in fact we are they're not framing it in that way but you're, mm -hmm. what you're suggesting is that there's an implicit argument uh, against you know uh, implicit of claiming of the status of listeners when they are being dismissed as wavelength wanderers um, so that's that's interesting to me but there, in a different way there's also a diminishing of certain listening practices in this narrative itself Right, because it, everything has to start with listening. I heard the song on the radio. I heard someone else request a song right, on the radio. Their name was heard on the radio. And then I had this desire to hear my voice on radio. And then I started writing letters. So there's still a listening is, um, if not a starting point, it is already happening before mm. one becomes listener, before one hear, before one writes the letter, waits, and then at some point declares that one has become listener. So there's mm -hmm. an, even in these narratives, it seems to me there is a certain uh, claiming of uh, a diminishing of certain kinds of listening. So listening by itself, listening that is not writing, that is not reading, is somehow not listening, even in these narratives. So they actually, there's a, uh, they dovetail to some extent with, um, you know, Malik's mm -hmm. and the radio announcers dismissal of casual listening uh, maybe I no know. i think you're absolutely right there i um i uh, i don't um i don't think i i don't think i would disagree with that at all i think there is that kind of that dovetailing does happen um there is um but i think what was interesting for me was um and, and i think this is where in some senses uh, and and this also takes me to the second question, right? Which is the question of sound and movement in some ways. The what what is interesting to me is this then this tension that you've marked out because sound movement allows for becoming, it produces becoming, um, but yet there's this very constant and very insistent yanking back, not just into place, but I would say into this is listening as you're saying, right, the, this, this is what constitutes listening, not that, that is not. Um, and in that, and there are layers, you're absolutely right. So the layers of practices of distinction um, that are taking place here. The other, the other thing that I think is, um, that, that, that's quite interesting, and again, uh, sort of works with this in, in the same kind of tense uh, manner in this situation is, sorry, the way in which um, 
uh, in some senses, I think what it means to kind of um, become listener, to be able to send out that farmayash, to be able to repeatedly send those farmayashes, what that means in terms of listener um, is something that is both being articulated in terms of sound and yet not being articulated in terms of sound. If you, so there's a, uh, there's that kind, and I think that's the tension that I found myself actually even rubbing up against while I was writing, um, you know, some of this material together. Um, I, again, I'm not sure that uh, wholly answers what you put to me, but I, I absolutely don't disagree with what you're saying in terms of um, the practice of these narratives kind of dovetailing with the radiant answers. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm going to ask one more question since I, I have the floor. Um, and this, you're framing this in terms of vernacular, which I thought was really interesting because mm -hmm. what I want is to use your work beyond the vernacular, right? So I, I want to claim it to think about uh, listening to cinema in general, right? Mm -hmm. Rather than just a set of, not just, rather than a set of listening practices or processes that are um, limited to or about or coming from a place of the, you know, small town radio listeners, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm really struck by the by the use of vernacular, which places mm. it in a particular way. When I love it, love it so much, I want to use it for everything. Um, so I'm wondering if you want to talk a little more about that the purchase of vernacular, which you were again mm. beginning to do at the end. Um, but I'd love to hear more. Yeah, that I actually. Um, so I. That is something that I am trying to develop a little again. It's something that, yes, I, it, I sort of, which is why I think this work I would think of as being toward a certain kind of uh, vernacular techniques. Um, I think by vernacular here though, I'm using it in sort of specific ways, um, which is, I think I would want to use it in terms of the local in term and not necessarily not necessarily vernacular as in parochial, uh, although arguably it could be that as well. But why I want to think about the vernacular in particular is for two reasons. One is um, I think I'm trying to think through not just um, techniques of sound as they appear through the radio or through print or through cinema, which and at the intersection of those um, in terms of what uh, they are as technologies, media technologies. But I am also wanting to see them in concert with language as technology, right? So vernacular also in that sense, language as a certain kind of tool, as a certain kind of medium, as a certain kind of technology, right? Um, um, musical traditions, oral traditions. So th there's so, which is why for me, sociality and the vernacular uh, in terms of, or the linguistic, uh, broadly speaking out. And I'm, forgive me because I'm using the words as placeholders right now, because this is an argument I'm still kind of working through. Um, is, um, for me, they, they, they're kind of coming together to produce a local technical, local hyphen technical um, relationship. So this is the sense in which I'm thinking the vernacular. And in fact, at, if at this point, if I may steal one of your arguments <laughs> about, uh, about the accent and ways of listening um, through, you know, um, when you, for instance, when you talk about Bambaya, or you talk about the presence of Marathi or other such languages in and through Bombay cinema and so on. I think for me, that would be just such an interesting way to think about the vernacular techniques of sound. That perhaps just at the level, I mean, specifically with what I remember of your argument and forgive me if I'm mis misstating it, um, but, um, but I think at the level of your argument, it, you know, it 
I'd want to think of it as probably cinema sound, accent, language. That would be the kind of cluster or uh, constellation, however you wish to put it. Um, whereas um, I'm I'm thinking of it in terms of yeah linguistic affective community. So linguistic affective communities of, in this case, Hindi Urdu, but could equally be for so many other things. Uh, so yeah, I think maybe local hyphen technical is a provisional kind of um, placeholder. Um, and so, yes, I, I do think that there's a way in which what I'm saying wouldn't be particular only to say Hindi Urdu, like that there'd be a certain kind of abstraction um, in terms of um, uh, you know, one could think about how it works out in Tamil or in Bangla or or even in other languages. I mean, why not French? You know, um, let you know. Let's let's actually have those kinds of conversations. We've kind of assumed we know how Euro American technicity is also unfolding in you know um, along certain lines. Um, yeah, that's, sorry, that's about what I have for now. <laughs> yeah, no, that sounds really interesting. And I, I think I was just, um, uh, so, so many key sound studies concepts, just as in film cinema studies are coming out of a Euro-American context, right? That when I resonate, when there are concepts that come out of a South Asian context, for instance, that resonate, right? I want them to travel. So that was partly, it was a sort of political right. The motivation, right, for asking you to talk about the vernacular. No, thank you. Thanks. I, I have to, I still have to work this out, as I said. So I'm, I'm thinking of, I am hoping local technical kind can travel. Um, um, but how do we think this? Because I suppose my once one more thing, one thing that I'm hesitating about, and, and this again may actually go back to that one very fundamental central tension that you identified between sound and movement on the one hand and um, um, place on the other is how does one think that kind of not, and it's a very naughty coming together, you know? Um, so I, I, I think there's a way in which, um, yeah, one, I also have to think much more about, much more about this. Uh, thank you, Vibhuti and Pavitra. Uh, there are a few questions already coming in, so uh, I think we should start taking them. Um, the first question um, is, lovely talk. Can you talk about the parasocial relationship between the RJ and the audience? What narratives come across and what kind of celebrity status of the RJ the magazine discuss? Magazines discuss. Right. Uh, thanks. That's uh, a great question. Yeah, actually, there's a um, there's a great sort of uh, I, I like the way you phrase it as a parasocial relationship because I tend to think of it as um, the RJs or at that point in time the radio announcers' own kind of oral stardom. Um, so uh, you know, um, having their uh, putting out photographs of the um, uh, radio announcers in these magazines, interviewing them for them, uh, writing letters to the radio announcers, sending them gifts, um, receiving gifts uh, from them, inviting them to weddings, um, uh, having them come down for special gatherings into their towns being organized by these radio listening uh, uh, clubs. These were all part of um, the kind of relationship between the radio announcers and um, uh, you know the, the, the audience listening in at that moment in time. Um, in fact, um, several uh, radio announcers of particularly of Radio Salon talk about with immense fondness, um, uh, members of these radio listeners clubs with whom they'd become friends with over the years, whom they'd kept up correspondence with um, and so on. As I hope that. The next question is from Dawn Jordan. Uh, 
uh, what do you yourself love, love about listening in your own life practice, please? What do I love about listening in my own life practice, in my own life practice? Is that the, is, did I get yeah. the question correct? Yeah. That's a good question. Um, I will have to think about that one. I'm uh, not entirely certain, except that uh, I think I grew up uh, in a world where the radio was a familiar um, sight. Um, more importantly, it was something that I think filled my days for uh, a huge part of it. Um, and because I've always sort of seen myself or thought of myself as a listener, um, I suppose that's what interests me, uh, being here and thinking about listening. Thanks, Vivuti. Uh, the next question is it's a slightly long one. I'm going to read it out uh, from Anandita Bajpai. Thank you for this amazing talk. As someone who's researching on international broadcasters, which were very popular in India around the same time that Vibhuti covers, I was wondering what the idiosyncrasies of this particular case may be. From my own ethnographic work with listeners clubs of Deutsche Welle and Radio Berlin International, I realized that the same listening publics could be part of Farmaish and want music as well as part of other listening spheres whereby they listened to avoid music. Particularly appreciating that these international broadcasters were not the typical Krishi program, but they were also not about music only. Let us not forget listening audiences in UP and Bihar have a fascination for news. So going by that would becoming a listener also point to simultaneous other registers. Uh, yes, actually, uh, thank you so much um, for this point, Anand. I completely do take it. I um, I do use the film song, but uh, as I said, I'm using the film song also fairly strategically. Um, um, but I also use the film song because it really it does, um, and I and this is what I what I would like to go back to. It's the it's one of the most dominant sounds um, of. Uh, certainly of the mid 20th century um, and continues to be so. So um, I absolutely do not uh, dispute that uh, the news could equally uh, become another register or that there were, um, you know, uh, radio listeners clubs for Deutsche Well and Radio Berlin International or even for, for that matter, I mean, one would say uh, the BBC because there's actually a lot of reportage and a lot of coverage of the BBC at, um, at this particular point of time. So certainly it, it, it would. Um, however, what I think, um, and, 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 and this, is, this is probably where I would make a, a, a specific claim for cinema here is that I think we would underestimate um, perhaps at our own peril, um, this the sheer popularity and the sheer spread of even, you know, something like Binaka Geetmala. Now, Binaka Geetmala was as popular for Amin Sayani as it was for um, the film songs. Um, but certainly um, the fact that, I mean, and to go back to something like the ban on film songs in AIR producing a uh, a listenership that does that just doesn't want to hear um, AIR thereafter after the film songs are banned. I think it just forces us to think of the film song in a, a certain kind of specificity. However, I, I certainly hope that the coming listener is not dependent only upon the film song as a conceptual uh, uh, category or uh, a concept. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Vibhuti. Uh, the next question is from um, Sitara Pracha. Um, the question is, I am a Quaker and our practice of listening is often a challenge to newcomers to the practice. Uh, 
My feeling is that listening is the hope of our troubled world. How significant then that people are often frightened by the power of becoming as much a listener as a teller. Can you comment on the relationship between fear and listening? Um, I will have to very uh, honestly apologize uh, for not being able to answer this question. Unfortunately, I uh, have neither come across um, this kind of relationship in um, the kind of material I work with. And um, I fear that I know too little uh, to be able to say anything here. So I do apologize. Uh, um, thank you for the question. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not in a position to answer it. Um, the next question is from Natasha Lodges. Thank you for your wonderful talk and Professor Sundar's thoughtful questions. I come from the issue of listening as a historian of Western classical music, as well as someone who broadcasts. I wonder whether all those magazine entries were genuine, firstly, or written by magazine editors to encourage more listeners or to popularize particular songs. Uh, what financial models did the radio stations operate on and did they need listeners or advertising for revenue? And I wonder whether the need to hear one's name on the radio reflects a need for visibility within a community to perform culture for one's friends. For example, to hear one's name when listening together to give status. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Natasha. Uh, if I may sort of quickly disaggregate some of the points that you've made and respond to them. Um, whether all the magazine entries were genuine or not, uh, to be honest, it's slightly difficult to say. These magazines are not easily available. They're not, uh, they're not part of any official archives. Um, these are part of um, old radio listeners, private papers. Um, most of them have thrown them away um, because they're little more than rubbish. Um, in fact, the the gentleman who very kind, who very very kindly lent me his um, set of papers with a whole cross section of these magazines would keep would keep saying to me, "But why do you need these? You know, these are not relevant. They have a few important articles, but the rest of it is irrelevant. They're just irrelevant. These are not important." Um, so, I'm not uh, as, but nevertheless, he was one of the people who would be writing into these. I mean, one of the reasons he had this collection of magazines was he was someone who would be writing into them, writing into the radio shows, um, just being part of this world, subscribing to these several magazines and so on and so forth. So while it's not possible, certainly to say that all the articles were uh, genuine, um, uh, I do not see this set of magazines at least having a relationship with popularizing songs on air, not the magazines. The requests for songs, however, were another matter. There's a lot of, uh, if you look at the newspapers of the time, in, um, there's a lot of debate on to what extent the requests for these songs was genuine. So the fact that there would be these hundreds of thousands of requests coming in from towns that the met, that metropolitan India had never heard of, so Jhumri Talaya, Rajanand Gaon, um, these are all these were places that were considered figments of imagination, and the fact that there would be these thousands and thousands and thousands of letters and requests for songs coming in from there, um, there there was a tremendous anxiety about whether or not these were genuine requests. These requests used to sometimes, uh, or and the number of requests would sometimes have uh, uh, perhaps not financial implications necessarily, but certainly implications about uh, popularity and therefore uh, perhaps circulation of films and film song uh, runtime on air uh, on the radio. Uh, in terms of the financial models that the radio stations operated upon, well, state radio stations didn't um, uh, were owned and broadcast and uh, were supported by the state. Vivid Bharti launched um, in the late 50s, early 60s, was the first um, 
commercial radio station so the first state radio station that was that allowed commercial broadcasting or advertising on it radio salon radio goa um um radio jalandhar all took on uh commercial broadcasting uh as well i mean they were commercial broadcasting and they did use advertising for revenue so for instance again uh, to go back to um amin sayani and binaka geetmala the very famous uh program uh, from this radio program from this period um that that's often remembered um that was uh, sponsored by sibaka um uh, for for a very long time it was um uh sibaka geetmala because uh, that was the name of the toothpaste brand that used to sponsor the uh show um i on the i will uh, do an um uh, on the visibility within a community and the name hearing the name on air i think the hearing the name on air is a more complicated story than that um i it's it it has to do with community popularity but also the popularity of the name of a town um um and as uh, so the farmaish is um and i won't get into the farmaish at length right now but that's that's a, that's a whole other paper <laughs> sorry i hope that uh, helps address your question thanks vibhuti um next question uh is from charu singh Vibhuti thank you for a captivating talk that rendered me utterly your listener two thoughts of thinking further number 1 is the moment of inscription of becoming a listener actually about becoming a writer for many people who would never consider such writerly expression number 2 what is the place of register as variety of language for a particular purpose or in a particular communicative situation in unpacking mid 20th century listening practices and reports of listening here i am thinking of the relatively high register of the usage shrota which mm. listening which listening ecologies are film song listeners being disembedded and reembedded within once again fabulous talk oh thank you charu both fantastic points um is the moment of inscription the moment of the listener becoming writer as well and really about writing as much uh perhaps yes but as i hope i in i am i am thinking aloud here because this is a portion of the argument that i'm still developing um i'm also thinking definitely of um inscription practices of say stamping one's name on postcards um uh in the process of sending farmaishes and that stamping of the name on the postcard could happen even if you were illiterate um do we want to consider that stamping as a certain kind of writing uh, that's that's a question mark for me um but all I, all i would all i would do is that so um would it become a process of writing as well for people who are never considering writerly expression yes but that's why i would think of writing to within or placing writing within a certain kind of fold of listening i don't want to uh push it or divorce the two uh from that so those are sort of two points for me to um you know to my quick responses but i do need to um think about this more and unpack this further the second is the question of register that you point out and i think um that's again extremely interesting um where where is shrota coming from how is the usage being uh, looked at that's something i need to look into it's something i have not done yet um i have one portion of this uh, work that i really hope to unpack is actually the question of um is the question of language it's something that um i haven't um yet kind of uh, really kind of thought through but i also think that um i'm also also wondering about the use of certain kinds of standard words in radio talk so for instance if instead of sunne wala which is literally hear or the the person who's listening uh, the word comes up as shrota once and becomes acceptable usage and then simply gets repeated 
repeated across radio announcers, repeated across radio stations, and repeated across um, uh, the listeners themselves and adopted, therefore, in that language. However, this is a speculative answer. Um, uh, uh, to your to your your point, and in terms of um, you know which listening ecologies of film song listeners being disembedded with uh, from and being re-embedded within, I think that's um, actually uh, in some senses that's the kind of question that I'd like to be moving to moving towards um, um, as I kind of try and un unpack further what uh, what this techniques of sound could look like. Uh, so thanks thanks very much uh, for both both those points. Thank you so much, Vibhuti. And I think it's uh, time to wrap up and also we don't Thank have any so further much. questions. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much, much to you and to Pavitra. Um, and also Vibhuti, thank you for staying up so late. And I know you have an early morning class tomorrow. And so uh, apologies yeah. and thank you for uh, joining thank you. us today. Yeah. Thank you so much uh, for putting this together. It really was a pleasure. <laughs> and to Pavitra for such a lively discussion. I wish we had more time to continue with this. But thanks once again. Thank you to our audience who joined us tonight. Uh, our next talk is next week, 1st of March, same time. And we have Urvi Khetan from Oxford University, who's going to speak on women's work in war and famine. Um, and she's going to speak from her research on the Second World War. So do join us. And uh, thank you once again for uh, participating tonight and uh, stay well, stay safe and see you next week. Thanks. <laughs>